Hello and welcome to Analog Insights. In today's episode of Talking Cameras, I'm sitting down with Nick Carver. Nick is a commercial architectural photographer based in Orange County, California, and uh, shares his expertise in his YouTube videos and online courses. Many of you will know Nick from YouTube with his photography on location series or the behind the, uh, behind the glass with a glass series. And um, we can also highly recommend his uh, online classes, especially the one on metering light correctly, but basically everything he does around film photography is really valuable and interesting. Nick always was and still is a true inspiration for this YouTube channel here as well. And I couldn't wait to for the opportunity to sit down with him and talk shop. Um, we, of course, as always for this format, talked about his personal camera collection and the stories behind these cameras and how he got them, but then also looked at his hybrid process that he's famous for, um, his one-shot approach, and also, of course, a little bit his YouTube channel and the storytelling that makes it so great. Um, we hope you enjoy this conversation. Let's dive in there. So, welcome on the show, Nick. Um, I'm so glad to have you. And um, the first question, as always, for Talking Cameras is um, a short introduction of yourself. Um, would be great. Of course, the audience heard a little bit of an introduction, but it would be great to hear it in your own words first. Sure. Uh, yeah, first off, thanks for having me, man. I'm really excited to, to do this. You may have bitten off more than you can chew, though. I'm not known for my short responses when talking photography. But um, yeah, so I'm a photographer based in California. And um, I uh, shoot architectural uh, photography professionally, but most people probably know me from YouTube. So uh, I do a lot of analog photography based YouTube stuff and uh, like to photograph buildings there too frequently, but also uh, the deserts of the American Southwest. And uh, yeah, uh, analog photography is really, really my jam. It's what I'm most interested in. And of course, for this format, you also brought a couple of cameras and I would be um, yeah, curious which one is the first one that you want to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm going to start with the, uh, the RZ67. Um, so, uh, and I may be going out of order here, sorry if I am, but I um, kind of want to start with the RZ67, which is a huge medium format camera. I like to call this thing the tank because it's uh, so freaking heavy. Um, but I bought this back in uh, 2012 uh, with the film back, the waist level finder, and a 90 millimeter lens. And I got it for $455. Um, which, which is incredible today, right? <laughs> it's insane. They're going for uh, like $1,100, $1,200 now from what I've seen on eBay. Um, and uh, so if, let's just start off by making all the viewers cry a little bit. Um, but, but did you know what you were been. getting into back then? No. So that's the thing. Um, in, in 2012, that's kind of when I decided I'm getting back into film photography. And um, I had always been a 35 millimeter guy. I never shot medium format before. I never shot large format. And uh, I really wanted to try medium format, but I didn't know anything about the cameras. And um, this was a real dead point in analog photography in, around 2012 because digital had completely taken over. Nobody was shooting film anymore. So there weren't even that many resources on like, well, what's a good medium format camera? So I did a little bit of research online. I came across the RZ67 somewhere and just started scouring eBay. And I had, I had no idea if it was a good medium format camera. It just happened to be kind of in my price range. And I wanted a pretty big negative because I felt if I was going to go from 35 millimeter to medium format, I wanted to go like full medium format. Um, and so, with the little bit of research I did, I decided to, to go with the RZ67. And um, I found this on eBay and it was in great shape. It's starting to de de deteriorate a little bit. I have some uh, of the grip kind of coming apart, so I got to do something about that. But um, when it showed up to me, uh, there was a big dent in the lens where the filter thread is. Um, and it's, that happened in shipping because, again, this thing is so damn heavy that even as well as he packed it, it's just when they set it down, it just landed right on there, dented the, the filter ring. And um, so I had to make a little wood. Um, you can tap out filter ring dents by like making a, a curved wood piece and you set it in there and then you take a wood dowel and you tap it and you, you try and form it out. So 
Um, so I formed it out and it, it, I put a filter on there, so it's working fine now. But um, I really had no idea what I had at the time. I, I didn't know how popular this camera was going to get. And, um, you know, the 6x7 negative is just ha has excellent resolution and it's almost like shooting large format at times because um, you kind of have to go pretty slow with this camera uh, just given its weight and size. Um, but the main thing about this camera is it really introduced me to medium format. Uh, so it got me comfortable with medium format. And the biggest thing that I remember from my early days with this camera is just getting so confused by the waist level finder. Just fighting my instincts of wanting to go left when my brain's telling me to go right. And it is looking down into a camera. This is the first camera I ever had where I looked down into it. And um, that was a lot of fun getting used to. And uh, it, it's, it's funny how your brain works. Like I've gotten so used to looking down at a waist level finder and kind of having the backwards image that if I look down at a digital camera with the screen flipped out, I actually end up going reverse. It's really weird. Yeah, the, the same happens to us all the time with our small Lumix camera. Whenever we shoot, uh, it's the same effect. Uh, I'm yeah. glad it's not just me. Yeah. I thought my brain might have been broken. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I ended up kind of going going crazy on getting accessories for this RZ. Like once I, I kind of fell in love with it and realized what I had, I ended up getting multiple lenses and multiple film backs. And uh, I got one of the AE prism finders. Um, that uh, you know lets it work more like a traditional SLR. Um, so I have this thing pretty well kitted out, and um, it's my heaviest backpack when I have all my all my RZ stuff in it. Um, but it's really fun camera, really cool camera, and I can see why it's so popular uh, amongst analog shooters today. And speaking of, of special uh, medium format formats, you, you also brought another camera that um, most viewers see you, um, I wouldn't say all the time with, but most of the time when it comes down to a photography on location um, episode, you typically bring it along and uh, shoot some 6x17, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that's my baby. Um, my 6x17 camera is easily the best purchase I've ever made. Um, so I was, uh, I started dabbling in 6x17 with a uh, um, 6x17 roll film back for 4x5. And if you look at my really early YouTube videos, that's what I'm using. Um, and uh, that worked pretty well for a little while, but I, I ran into some limitations, mainly with focal length uh, options, because uh, you really can't go shorter focal length than about 90 millimeters, and that's on a recessed lens board. Um, but mainly you can't go longer than about 180 millimeters or so because the small back of 4x5 um, clips the image by the time it gets to the 6x17 frame. So um, I really wanted to get a dedicated 6x17 camera. Um, and the main one out there that everybody knows and kind of covets is the, the Fuji GX617, which is for my money, like the best looking camera that's ever been designed. It is so freaking cool looking. And um, it, they're way bigger than people think, like, or at least than I thought, because I would see pictures of it, not in someone's hands, just on a table or whatever. And you kind of think it's, oh, it's gonna be like a little Hasselblad X-Pan or something. But then you see it in someone's hands and it's giant. Um, so that's what I started looking at. But for anyone who shopped for one of those, it's it, it, it might as well, as well have been a million dollars because it was, you know, even when I was getting into this stuff and, and things were cheaper, like to get a GX617 with a lens or two and the viewfinder, it would have been, you know, five, six thousand dollars easily. Um, but then I started thinking about it. OK, well, that type of camera has some limitations that I may not like anyway. Um, you know, it's ultimately a, a rangefinder camera or viewfinder camera, whatever you want to call it. Um, you, you have a separate viewing window from the lens to compose your shots. And for landscape photography, um, especially my style of photography at that time, uh, the big problem I had with that is I wouldn't be able to position split neutral density filters. Um, so being able to, to put a dark, uh, darkening effect on the sky because I was shooting a lot of sunsets and stuff at that time. Um, and that seemed like a deal breaker to me. 
uh, I really wanted to be able to see exactly where the filter is going to be. So I kind of started researching, well, what other type of 6x17 cameras are there, or are there any that might even be the only, the only one out there? Uh, and I eventually found out there's view style camera, um, or view camera style 6x17s, which is what this is. And so this is a Shenhao uh, TFC 617A. Um, and it's just like a 4x5 or an 8x10 in that you have a ground glass uh, that you do all your viewing and composing. The thing that trips people out is that it's so long and skinny like this, so um, it, it's kind of weird looking at it from the back if you're used to 4x5 and 8x10, but um, works just like any other view camera. It's got rise and fall and shift and tilt and swing and, um, you know, when I got this, uh, I wasn't as good with those movements uh, operating a camera like this, but I've gotten uh, much, much better at it to where I kind of don't like using a camera that doesn't have them. You know, if I'm doing landscape or buildings, um, I really like having the ability to shift and rise and fall and tilt and swing. And that camera lets me do all that in a panoramic format, which is really cool. Uh, so, so listening to you, it also sounds like there were cameras that you just purchased with fairly little research. And then there are cameras where you yes. put quite a bit of research in with very special needs, like I want to see how my filters behave and all that. Um, how did that evolve over time in your, in your journey? Because I think most people just look at the market and today there's a lot of guides, but it's also overwhelming. And what helped you kind of find your um, cameras? Yeah, I, um, I've bought several cameras, um, hoping they're going to turn me into a photographer that I'm not. Like, I'm not being honest with myself of, like, how I like to shoot. So the perfect example of that is I bought a Mamiya 6 at one point, and that's a square format rangefinder camera. Um, and I bought that because I wanted to shoot more, like, handheld, daily life type photos. And um, I never really used a rangefinder before. That's largely why I didn't get the GX617 is I like seeing the exact image because I'm very particular about composition and framing and all that kind of stuff. So having to be a little bit sloppier about framing didn't jive well with me. But I still bought the camera because I thought it was going to turn me into a photographer I'm not, which is like, you know, go out and take pictures of daily life and everything. And um, I had that camera for, I don't know, six months. And then I just decided this isn't the camera for me. I'm not a rangefinder guy um, because I just like being more precise with my camera. So I guess I just kind of had to admit to myself that like, I'm not going to be taking a bunch of pictures of day-to-day -day life. That's just not me. Photography is a different thing for me. I'm a one shot kind of guy. I like going out and really dissecting one composition and just like pouring my all into that one thing. And some photographers, you know, they make great street photographers. They make great, uh, like, uh, lifestyle photographers. They can go out and they can, you know, take a ton of pictures and, like, kind of go with the flow a little bit more and not dissect every single shot and not try and get every, every shot with perfect lighting. They're good at finding the moment that makes up for the lighting not being so good or whatever. I'm always hoping I'm going to be one of those photographers, and I never am. So... Uh, I just tend to lean towards cameras now where either the camera's going to do everything for me so I can treat it like my iPhone camera or I have to do everything and I have to break out the loop and I got to get real careful with it and it's got to be a tripod and everything. It's kind of one or the other for me. That's super interesting and for me at least this is also what you're you've become famous for on, on YouTube right? to be that meticulously working guy who yeah. spends sometimes yeah, a, a couple of days researching a site, coming back to it over and over again until you have the right weather condition, the right overcast or whatever you want, and get the right moment with the very limited numbers of shots that you have, typically four, I think, on the 6x17 yeah. um, format. And to get that one shot and also listening to you discussing these shots, then it's just incredible. And um, I, I would think of myself more on the other end of the spectrum, more of the street photography guy with, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, lagging these skills. And, and even here on our channel, we get super inspired by you and even created a format that is called One Shot because Jules is the one who's rather 
yeah, very focused on individual shots and very keen on composing um, shots properly. So I, at least uh, I believe you've inspired a lot of people when it comes to <laughs> um, <laughs> thinking differently of photography and really taking your time, taking that one shot. Oh, I appreciate that. I, I hope I hope that's the case. I know I can take it to an extreme sometimes to where I'm I'm pulling my hair out trying to, you know, because everything was perfect, but that one cloud is in the wrong, wrong spot or something. And there's there's definitely a way to take it to the extreme, which I do sometimes. But um, yeah, it's I don't know if photographers tend to admire the thing that they're not, but I, I always uh, have much more admiration and and kind of wish I was more like a good street street photographer. You know, I see photographers like uh, like Matt Day or something where he, he's taking just amazing photos every day and like he, he always has his camera with him and he loves getting into it and like you know really documenting life and I always have these grand designs of like I'm gonna start doing that so then I, I think it's the camera so then I buy a camera <laughs> thinking that's gonna make me be that way and then I just never bring it out I never take the camera out because I I don't have that thing in me that wants to take pictures of my life and it's much to my detriment because I have like no photos to look back on um, no pictures of me and my wife no pictures of renovating my house or whatever it's like I have no documentation of my life because photography has become this other thing for me which I don't know is necessarily healthy but I just have to you know um, acknowledge my my nature because that's no matter how much I try, I just don't end up taking a lot of pictures of day-to-day of -day life. Well said. <laughs> <laughs> um, and yet you also have other cameras in your, in your collection. And um, the next one surprised me a little bit. Can you, can you shed some more light on, on this one, the Fuji? Yeah. So um, this is actually a perfect uh, example of what we we're talking about. So like, I, uh, this is a Fuji GA. 645 ZI um, and uh, I bought this camera because I went on a this like once in a lifetime trip to Hawaii with my wife and, and her family and I, I brought the RZ67 if you can believe that so I, I, I went to, to Maui and I, I brought this and a couple of lenses and I had to bring a tripod and a bunch of film. It was ridiculous. So I got there. I didn't really want to bring this camera out at all because it was so big. And so I did what I always do, which is like, oh, if I just had a camera that was more convenient and smaller and I could pop it out, I would be taking pictures of us on this trip and everything. So I went on eBay on the trip and started looking for, <laughs> which was, I'm sure, great for everyone involved. Uh, so I'm staring down at my phone looking for a good, like, point and shoot medium format. Um, should have been looking for 35 millimeter. I just was so in the medium format zone that I wanted a medium format uh, compact camera. And this is what I ended up, uh, my research kind of led to, is uh, Fuji offers some of the best. There's a, I think a Contax as well, which is kind of similar design, but has a manual lever and things like that. So I looked at that one too. Um, but I settled on this because it, uh, it's such a late model camera that it has a lot of modern conveniences. So it has, you know, aperture priority mode and autofocus. And um, it, it's kind of a strange design because it's, it's like the old pocket cameras your mom used to carry around that had the, the power zoom. And it's got four positions, the zoom. It's uh, 55 millimeters, 65 millimeters, 75 millimeters, and 90 millimeters. So it's not even much of a zoom, but um, it's enough to be kind of convenient. But I got this as my, my point and shoot camera. And in typical fashion, I don't end up using it all that much because I don't do a lot of point and shoot stuff. But I can't part with it because I have a soft spot for like 90s and 80s electronics. And this has just enough 90s cues of like a modern electronic from that era that it's too beautiful, I can't, I can't get rid of it. And every time I do use it, I love the photos uh, so much because the lens, although it's a zoom lens, I think it might be the sharpest lens I own, um, which is surprising. But uh, as someone told me, I think at a camera store, Fuji's ultimately a lens company. They're not really a camera company. Um, so they know how to make lenses. And uh, 
the lens has this gorgeous vignette to it, this natural vignette um, that I really love. And uh, black and white is my favorite to shoot in here because it, it takes on such a character and that, that deep vignette looks so good. And um, my goal with this camera really is when I go out uh, camping in the desert or whatever and I'm doing my serious stuff with a big view camera, I, I like I want to bring this out and like take pictures of the, the campsite and take pictures of my car out in the, the wilderness and pictures of my camera and pictures of, you know, uh, quicker shots of, in, of little details and whatever that I'm not going to break out the huge camera for. So this can kind of become my iPhone camera when I'm out there uh, in between shots with the with the big heavy duty stuff. Um, the uh, the only complaint really I have with this camera is that it's autofocus. And that's only because, uh, well, partly it's loud. So the motor runs every time. So if I'm trying to do like, you know, incognito street photography, this ain't gonna do it. Also when it winds to the next shot, it's pretty loud. Um, but it has one autofocus point, it's in the center, and it's accurate if it's, if it's accurate, but um, there's really no way to verify it other than looking at there's a distant scale on the right side of the viewfinder, right or left side, yeah, right side. And it'll tell you the distance that it focused on, but that's the only way you can verify that it focused on the right thing. And usually I'm just paying too much attention to the subject and I don't notice and it said it focused on infinity, but my subject's only five feet away. So the, the autofocus is a little bit of a, a nuisance, but um, the camera's so beautiful and it's, uh, it's got such a great lens, I just don't wanna get rid of it. That's beautiful. And I can so much relate to the 1990s design. We, we talked the other yeah. day and, and realized we're basically the same age. And, yeah. <laughs> and to me, it reminds me of the Sega, um, you know, stuff that oh, you yeah. play, played at home a little bit and, and, and certain yeah. Nikon designs as well. And you, you, I know that feeling of not being able to, to pass something on that reminds you of these yeah, yeah. childhood memories at the end of the day. And, uh, the, 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 and also that little bit of noise that certain electronic motors are making and, oh, yeah. and things like that yep the click the click of the buttons are different yeah everything's different yeah, yeah. And, and in this particular case i would love to see some of the images that you've taken with it because it sounds really like fundamentally different than the 90 percent of images that you share on your on your channel and that you discuss yeah. um, so much so yeah um, I'll, uh, I'll i'll definitely share some of those if you want to put them in the in the video because um I, I do really love the shots that come out of it. And every time I, I develop a role from it, I'm like, why am I not using this camera more? And then I just kind of forget about it and it sits in my drawer and then I break it out and I go through the same cycle again. So, <laughs> yeah. And it's also an interesting format and maybe sticking to that and then to the next camera, um, uh, you also have another six by 4.5 in your, your collection that you wanted to discuss. Yeah. Um, yeah. 645 is, is kind of a weird format as, um, the manager at my uh, my camera shop or my uh, my processing lab, uh, which is Pro Photo Connection in Irvine. But John there has known me since I was fourteen, so he likes to likes to bust my balls, as we say here in the U.S. Um, but he told me he said six forty five format is pointless. <laughs> he just told it straight out to me. He's like, do, if you want something that small, go with thirty five millimeter. If you want medium format, do six by six or above. Um, which I get where he's coming from. Uh, it does kind of make sense, but um, 35 millimeter uh, always just feels like way too many pictures to me um, because I am kind of a one shot guy. It just takes forever to finish a roll. So um, a lot of the reason I like 645 is I get more resolution, which is good, but mainly, you know, I get 15 shots, uh, 16 shots, depending on the camera. That's like perfect. Uh, and then I can move on and, and finish the roll and kind of call it a day. But um, the other 645 I have is the Mamiya 645 Pro TL. Um, and uh, I have I have this largely because I wanted a smaller RZ67. Like I, uh, I love Mamiya designs. The way they design their controls and everything is very uh, intuitive to me and kind of um, idiot proof ultimately when you're out there. Uh, but it's great because it's it's more compact. Uh, it's an SLR, which I do better with because I can get much more uh, careful with my composition. I wanted something that had the option at least for a built-in meter 
um, because I didn't want to have to carry a separate light meter or estimate metering. Um, so this has a nice uh, AE prism finder. And um, yeah, this one's been a lot of fun. It's been, it was a little frustrating in the beginning because I had a focus issue that I didn't know about, um, except for that my pictures were out of focus and I thought I just sucked. I, I thought I was not focusing well, uh, but it turns out there's a mirror stop in there that was cracked and I had to replace it. But, um, but one of the things I love about this camera and kind of the RZ to a degree is uh, they're very modular. So if there's, I can really customize it for the type of photos I'm planning on going out and taking. So like right now I have a, a manual winder. I can just pop that off and put on a, uh, a battery operated motor winder and then it'll shoot much quicker uh, for me. And that's nice if I'm going out camping and I just want to get quick shots of uh, you know trucks off-roading or whatever. Um, AE prism finder can come off if I don't want to uh, use it like an SLR. And um, when I bought this, it came with the uh, waist level finder, which is very lucky because these things are actually kind of expensive, uh, the waist level finders. Um, they're funny though, because if you think about it, it's 645. So that means you're dealing with a horizontal image. And so if you're using the waist level finder, you really can only do horizontal compositions. You can only do landscape because if you want to do vertical, you'd have to go to the side of the camera and uh, view it that way, which is kind of impractical. But um, they have like a, a way around that with a little, you know, viewfinder thing you can look through, but you know, that's missing a piece and it's not super accurate, whatever. But, um, but anyway, this camera has been fun to like kind of, uh, keep on the passenger seat when I'm going out doing a, a trip with friends or whatever. And um, I can just grab it if something suddenly presents itself. And, uh, you know, I leave it on aperture priority mode, let the built-in light meter take care of it. Um, and it usually does uh, a good enough job that I don't have to, I don't have to treat it like a large format image every time, you know, because uh, I tend to fall into that if the camera's not going to help me out very much. I gotta, I either have to get 100% precise or really let the camera do most of the heavy lifting. Um, so uh, this camera has been, been a lot of fun to work with. Again, super interesting. And actually this, this particular Mamiya was one of the first ones that I had in the medium format field and that taught me a lot. And I remember comparing the, the images from photo shoots, especially portraits from a 35 millimeter camera to this format. And I certainly saw quite a difference. So I, I heard yeah. the same piece of advice and I was always like, no, that's not true. You get a completely different feeling in the images. And I was instantly drawn to medium format as, as well. And yeah. uh, speaking of medium format, what, what I found so interesting about your collection um, and the cameras you share today is that you appear to be gravitating to special formats, especially, of course, 6x17, but then also um, yeah, 6, 645, because I, I rarely see you use a 6x6, for instance. Um, and if I, I think together with the RZ67 and an adapter, yeah. I, I saw a couple of times. Um, uh, but but you're not like the typical medium format um, kind of twin lens reflex uh, camera yeah. uh, shooter uh, or Hasselblad shooter. I'm just yeah uh, going yeah. only for the square format. And I would be really interested in why that is and how your journey um, get, went and took you to where you ended up. Yeah, I've been uh, kind of gravitating towards odd formats. I think maybe just because it, it's a way to make your work separate a little bit from everyone else. Um, I actually, I really like six by six and, uh, the six by six back I have for my RZ. Um, I find myself, the more I'm, when I use my RZ lately, I tend to be on the six by six more than anything. Um, the only problem I have with it though, is I've replaced the light seals and it's, it's supposed to be light tight now, but just every once in a while, there's one frame that had a, a big, bad light leak. So I, I can't figure it out. So it was a little bit of a dice roll using it. Um, and then a viewer was real nice to gift me a Mamiya C220, which is a, a TLR. And, um, I, I mean, before anyone else, anyone listening thinks that's some insane gift, uh, they're, they're going for like 150 bucks or something on eBay. It's not, not like he gifted me a $2,000 camera or anything, but it's, a uh, in pristine shape and it's a TLR and it's square format. And, um, I, I love the images that come out of it. 
again, I run into the issues of like, it's a separate um, uh, viewfinder and I'm kind of more used to SLR and, uh, you know, uh, field camera uh, type cameras. So I AC turned on, let me just turn that off real quick. Um, so that camera is a lot of fun to use, uh, as the case, as is the case with mo most TLRs, there's no built in light meter. Um, it's, you know, it, it's manual everything. And when I find myself using a camera that's manual everything, I start getting into large format mode where I'm just being real careful with my metering. I'm, I'm getting super careful with focus and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, well, if I'm going to get, if I'm going to slow down that much, I might as well just do large format or just do something that's a little, um, you know, a little more involved. So, um, cameras like that can sometimes <clears throat> end up in this no man's land with my photography where they're not quite quick enough for me to be doing my, my snapshotty type things, but they're not quite slow enough or high resolution enough to really replace my large format. So it, they kind of fall into this area where I'm not using them as much as I should. You touched a little bit on it before. I would be super curious about that again, that one-shot approach that you are famous for, I would say. Um, how did you develop that over time and how did you end up um, becoming such an expert with that and get, getting into that, as you said, your large format mode um, when shooting? Yeah, I mean, I hope I'm an expert on it. I'm always doubting that myself, but uh, I, it ultimately, um, it, it was a slow evolution because um, what happened is I, I hit a pretty bad uh, slump in my photography around 2012 and that's where film photography kind of brought me back from the dead. And I won't rehash that too much. I've talked about that on my channel enough, but um, one of the things that came out of that is uh, I kind of made the decision that I'm, I'm only going to take photos that really excite me, like photos that um, I, I guess I had it so many times where I would take a photo and as I'm taking it, I know I'm not that into it, um, but I'm still taking the photo because I feel like I need to take photos for some reason. And I'm trying to convince myself that, oh, once I get it on the light table, I'll like it and whatever and all this kind of stuff. And then whenever I got that roll developed or, or got it back, I just, it ended up sitting on a, on a shelf or a desk somewhere because I just, I almost dreaded looking at the photos because I, I had no connection to them. I had no emotional um skin in the game because I just wasn't excited about the photos. But every once in a while I'd have a photo where like I couldn't wait to get the film back. I'm like checking in with the lab every every hour like hey are they done yet? Because I, I, I can jot, jot down there and pick it up. I know it's a long drive for me but I'll come down just for that and I'll battle traffic just to get that, that film back. So I had these kind of very distinct situations where like I'm super excited. I can't wait to see it on the light table. I can't wait to scan it. I can't wait to share it versus everything else. And because I kind of hit this slump, I decided to just carve out this, everything else and, and only do the shots that, that really I'm, I'm super excited to, uh, to work on. The only problem with that is there's not that many of those. Like, it's just not that many photos that are going to excite me that much because um, for what I like to shoot, which is buildings and landscapes and kind of street scenes in a landscape-y type way, um, you know, how often do you really drive by something and you're like, that's incredible. I really want to photograph that. Just doesn't happen all that much. So by not taking nearly or not devoting my energy to nearly as many photos, each photo naturally just sucks up a lot more energy to where I, I want it to be perfect because it's not even that there's so much writing on it because there's not that many photos I'm taking. It's just that it's a photo that I'm really excited about. And so I'm actually enjoying going back six or seven times. I'm enjoying like dissecting the, the scouting shot, you know, sitting on, cause I'll do scouting shots on my phone and I'll just sit back and forth, like flipping back and forth between two shots, you know, endlessly on my couch and like changing the cropping a little bit. And like, I'm really getting like, do I want that light pole in the shot or I want it out of the shot? And it sounds miserable to, I'm sure a lot of people, because that's probably not fun to a lot of people, but for some reason that's very enjoyable to me because I'm so excited to make this shot happen and make it happen uh, in the best way possible. So, um, you know, whenever 
I think that's why large format suits me so well is because that's kind of the natural process of large format is you have to be really precise and careful and you got to plan it all out ahead of time if you don't want to be wasting five dollar pictures and all this kind of stuff so um it suits me really well and um you know the the wild card is always getting the lighting right so that's kind of the because i'm dealing with all natural light and, and natural weather and all that so um that can get a little bit tedious and frustrating because I, I i know how i want it to look I, I know what i need i've gotten everything else dialed in and now it's just completely out of my hands i have no control over it so i just gotta wait until until things are perfect but um yeah it's a i think it's mostly just that i don't take that many pictures so they end up um you know taking a lot more attention okay that's super interesting so so much about the the one shot approach and you mentioned it already on the side um when you get negatives back from the lab you can't wait to scan them yourselves and then as you can see in your background you also end up putting a lot of the stuff on the wall and um You did a video about that once, but personally I would be super interested in that hybrid process that you're doing and be very curious about how exactly did you end up there, um, how, did you, how did it even occur to you to, to do it that way. Um, can you shed some light on that? Yeah, um, I think it mostly boils down to I'm a control freak with, without a dark room. So like, I, uh, I really didn't want the lab um, scanning my film because I, I didn't have any control over the the way the colors are rendered um on a print film uh so reversal film i don't really care who scans it because the the colors are the colors and you know they're they're relatively un unchangeable um but with print film there's so much interpretation that goes into uh the color inversion um which i think a lot of people starting off maybe don't realize like they they start comparing two films you know kodak portrait 400 versus fuji pro 400h and it's like Yeah, you can kind of do that, but it's got to be from the same scanner and the same technician uh, applying very similar adjustments if you really want to do an apples to apples comparison. But um, print film by its nature is so versatile in, in doing its inversion. And so I didn't want anyone else's fingers in that. Uh, I just kind of wanted uh, my decisions to be the only thing in the photo. Um, so that means darkroom or scanning myself. Uh, darkroom printing is obviously amazing. Uh, I have huge respect for anyone who uh, is very good at it. Um, I don't know enough about it to be good at it. Uh, I don't have my own darkroom and also um, a color printing darkroom is a little bit of a bigger commitment than uh, black and white. Like I could, I would definitely start with black and white before I, I dove into color printing because you got to deal with uh, color filters and and balancing that inversion yourself and you got to do tests and all this kind of stuff it's a it's a whole science unto itself um, so scanning myself scanning at home gave me the control over everything that I wanted uh, without having to go into the full darkroom process and um, you know digitizing negatives I definitely struggled with that for a while of like losing analog street cred points of like, oh, you're just digitizing your film, why shoot film kind of deal. And um, that did bother me for a little bit, but I don't care, any I don't care anymore. It's uh, everything is shared digitally. So if you're not going to digitize stuff, uh, no one's going to see it essentially. Um, or if you do offer prints, not many people are going to even be familiar with your prints. So um, it's important to have a digitizing aspect, even if you're full analog. Um, so I kind of made peace with that. But then when it comes to printing, um, you know, the big upside to digitizing negatives uh, for printing is easy repeatability. So, I mean, I can get uh, a print made of like that piece behind me today and it will look identical to that. Um, I don't have to recolor calibrate it. I don't have to um, make adjustments for anything because I have the digital file. It worked one time, it'll work again, as long as the printer is calibrated, which if you take it to a pro lab, it's gonna be. Um, so the, the hybrid process has worked really well for me because it kind of gives me the benefits of sharing digitally, which is a, a big aspect of people knowing who I am with the YouTube videos and Instagram. Um, and then I can put it back into print in the form of uh, you know, a print hanging on the wall or 
a book or whatever uh, without having to, um, without it taking forever in a dark room and, and dealing with uh, the extra stuff uh, that comes with that. Um, I will say though, I am kind of, I have dark room printing on the back burner mentally because I'm just waiting for the day that I get tired of photography again. It, it's not showing any signs of that whatsoever, so I think I'm good. But in the event I do get tired of it, I want to have darkroom printing as something I can grab of like, that's going to get me excited again. Um, I also have wet plate photography back there as well, but that one's way on the back burner because that's a, that's a whole nother commitment. But um, I like having that in my back pocket of like, eh, if I get bored one day, I'll start doing darkroom stuff. Yeah, I really like that. Like you're on your personal journey to have something that you can still aspire to and that you, as l once you get unhappy with where you currently are, you can still move to the next uh, level. Really like yeah. that thinking. And it would perfectly fit you and your, your channel as well, right? And how it has evolved yeah. over time. And, and s speaking of your, your channel, f at least from my perspective, you are uh, internet famous for making me watch 30 minute videos without even noticing it and <laughs> kind of <laughs> seeing the teaser and, and thinking, oh wow, it's another Nick Carver video. It's 30 minutes long or 40 and, and thinking, oh, let's see whether I can squeeze that into my evening. And then I end up, <laughs> yeah, kind of waking up when you have your outro, <laughs> the guitar <laughs> playing and everything. And I'm, I'm like, what, what did just happen? Um, so so your, your, your whole storytelling is just phenomenal. And um, I would be curious to, to learn a bit more about that, your approach to that and, and what kind of effort and thinking goes into your videos. Um, yeah, I, I, whenever I make a video, I think the main driving force is my low self-esteem, which ends up <laughs> creating better videos because I'm, I'm so assuming that people are just on the verge of clicking to something else because I, I'm not, I don't have as high, I don't have a high enough opinion of myself to want to watch me for 30 minutes. So it has to, I, I feel like it has to be something that is offering people something more than just, you know, me sitting in front of a camera and, and like uh, no script, nothing thought out. You know, I, I can't stand YouTube videos where, you know, it starts off with, hey, what's up, guys? You uh, you asked to make a video about this, so I'm, I'm making a video about this now. And it's like, dude, just tighten it up. Like, you're not that interesting. Like, we got to just get it going here. So I try and make my make sure my videos at least have you know, some sort of interesting story or some sort of challenge that I'm trying to overcome um, so that uh, maybe people who, you know, really don't care about me personally at all, which is going to be the vast majority of viewers, are still enjoying it because the, the content is interesting. And um, one of the biggest compliments I, I ever get is uh, people will tell me, oh, I love your videos, but my wife actually loves them too. And she'll watch them with me. And it's like, she's not a photographer. She doesn't give you know, she doesn't care about any of this stuff, but the story is interesting enough that she can, you know, uh, enjoy it. Or, um, so I, I try and keep that going throughout my videos. The difficult part with that is I just don't make as much content uh, as a lot of people. Cause, um, you know, I actually, I kind of feel for people that are, are really pursuing the YouTube thing with gusto, because if you're trying to make it your main thing, like YouTube rewards, tons of content. They, they just re reward you putting out more and more and more and more stuff. So it's very difficult to do that and actually put out something interesting and refreshed and all that. So I end up not doing very many videos com compared to some people, but I, I like to think and I hope that the videos are maybe a little bit more interesting or um, have a little more long term appeal because especially if I'm reviewing the latest camera like that's great for YouTube's algorithm but I really don't care about that and I'm not going to care about the video uh, down the road so um, yeah I just want to keep people engaged and you know it, I hopefully I think good story speaks to everybody um, and everyone can appreciate you know a good good struggle so that tends to be what drives it yeah that, that captures it quite nicely um, and and Yet your channel grew quite a bit, right? You, you even had breaks yeah. in between, and yet you were almost at the 100k um, <laughs> uh, mark. And yeah, uh, 
have created a lot of evergreen content, as I would call it, that is just out there and is still valid six years after some of the videos were made, right? It's still great. It's fantastic. Well, thank you. Um, that's the goal. So if, if that's what's happening, I'm, I'm very happy with that. So, um, Nick, thank you very much for this conversation, for, for sitting um, down with me on that uh, Wednesday morning on your side and Wednesday evening on my side. Um, I, I, to those of you who haven't seen Nick's videos, I can only highly recommend to go over and we will, of course, also link to some of them um, here in, in the show notes. Um, so thanks uh, for the conversation and have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. Really enjoyed it. Appreciate it, man. So thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Talking Cameras with Nick Carver and learned something new as I did in the course of the conversation. Um, it was very interesting to talk um, with Nick and uh, get to know him a little bit better. Um, if you like this video, please remember to like it and maybe even share it with your friends. And if you want to see more videos like this, please subscribe to our channel. Jules, Greg and I really appreciate each and every subscriber coming our way. So thanks for watching. I hope to see you soon. Bye.